Hello and welcome. I'm Katie Yates, Public Relations Specialist for the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Today we'll be talking about understanding and accessing our fishing laws. For those watching at home, be sure to type your questions into the chat box and we'll get to those towards the end of our conversation and as time allows. I'm joined today by three MDIFW staff members, Fisheries Management Section Supervisor Joe Overlock, Game Warden Brock Klukey, and Regional Fisheries Biologist Jim Pellerin. Thank you so much for joining today. We do have a lot to cover, so I'm just going to get started. And keep in mind, this video is recorded, so if you want to reference it later, you always can, or if you want to share with friends and family. So first of all, Joe, I think something on everyone's minds right now is it, well, it might be, why does the department regulate fishing? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Katie. Um, I can kind of narrow it down to five broad categories, I think. Um, those would be to protect native resources, to enhance fishing quality on individual waters, to maintain healthy ecosystems, uh, to control exotic species or non-native species in, in certain waters, and then in some cases where it's appropriate to, to meet social desires and interests of, uh, of public groups or, or individual users. Great, thank you. So Brock, before we jump into how to read the regulations, how can somebody at home find and access the fishing laws? Yeah, that's a uh, real good question too, Katie. Um, a lot of paper books that we have, you can get this stuff where you buy licenses, you know, town offices, uh, some of the convenience stores still have these law books um, who sell licenses. Um, you can, you can check it out on, you know, you can Google some of this stuff. Uh, you can also find uh, a lot of this stuff online, you know, through, you know, you can search uh, keywords like through, you know, on Google. Um, also now with the technology on our phones and stuff, you can save a screen app on your phone. Um, that's a quick way, quick reference that people can uh, really look at these laws quickly. Um, and that, that is a very good tool. Um, and we'll mention some other stuff later on, but, you know, one of the best things that we try as game wardens that if we answer questions for people to contact our local regional uh, IFNW offices and a lot of the uh, fisheries or wildlife, uh, they can answer those questions for you, whether it's game wardens or our secretaries there as well. Yeah, that's right. And we will be going over some of the different ways to access the laws later uh, with some demonstration and then some of the tools, the great tools that we have available to help anglers sort of decipher and, and get the information that they need. So Joe, oftentimes we hear from the public and I'm sure we're gonna see it in the chat uh, that our fishing laws are too complex. So why do they seem that way? Yeah, that's that's definitely something we hear and um, can can understand, but I think it's helpful to to look back and uh, maybe appreciate some of the history of fishing regulations in Maine. Maine has a really long history of regulating um, fishing uh, with special regulations. And it really dates back to the late 1800s when there were regulations put in place to prevent over harvest of fish. Uh, so things like bag limits or closures during certain spawning periods uh, when fish might be vulnerable uh, were common uh, as far back as, as then, you know, 140, 150 years ago. Around the 50s and 60s, started to see some regulations that were designed to enhance populations um, and to meet angler desires. So maybe creating trophy fisheries or uh, creating opportunities where you can have really high catch rates and, and be successful at catching high numbers of fish. Um, around the same time, we also started to see some regulations that were designed um, to prevent introductions of, uh, of bait fish species. So artificial lures only regulations, no live fish as bait uh, regulations uh, occurred around that time. Um, and, you know, really prior to then, there was less appreciation for the impacts of, of what could occur uh, and what, what could happen uh, in some of our waters if um, species that, that aren't native there uh, were to become uh, established. So, um, you know, then kind of fast forward to more more recent times, the last couple of decades, and there's been a real effort by inland fisheries and wildlife to create some new fishing opportunities, um, 
you know, maybe that's uh, opening waters to ice fishing or creating some fall opportunities where there aren't impacts to native, native populations. Um, so we have a long history of really specific specialized management that's really designed to, um, you know, protect resources, but balance opportunities at the same time. Um, you know, some of the other reasons are uh, Maine has a lot of resources available. There's over 6,000 lakes and ponds in the state, more than 32,000 miles of brooks, rivers, and streams. We're really fortunate here to have a lot of resources available for people to get out and, and fish. Um, Maine's also home to all kinds of special wild and native species like brook trout, arctic char, landlocked salmon, lake trout, lake whitefish, and oftentimes, um, you know, those special those special populations like that unique to Maine uh, require some specific regulations. Um, you know, so in the law book currently, there's a little over 1600 special regulations, which I know seems, seems like a lot. Um, and we do hear sometimes that the book is, is pretty lengthy, uh, but when you can compare it to the total number of waters that are available and the resources that are available in the state, it really is, is a fraction of it. Um, you know, another thing, Katie, I think that uh, folks may notice is we've gone through some changes over the last, say, 10 years or so, where we've really tried to make an effort to simplify the law book. And um, a lot of folks would probably rem remember it wasn't that long ago we had two law books, one for the ice fishing season and one for the open water season. Uh, we now have one law book. Um, and and the changes that occurred to make that happen, uh, you know, folks, folks may still be remembering what it was like before. So it may still seem kind of new to people. Um, I guess the only uh, advice I have for folks is just really try not to let the volume of the book intimidate you. And there really are some steps that you can take um, to kind of go through a step-by-step -step process to better understand the special fishing laws that are in place. Thank you so much for that, Joe. So I'm thinking that, Jim, it might be helpful to quickly walk through the steps for using the law book and review some of the key things for anglers to keep in mind when they're looking through the law book. Great, right, Katie. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here and got about, got about six or seven slides just to kind of help us walk through that process. Can you guys see that screen? Yeah. All right, so there's basically, um, when you look, before you even think about looking at the law book and interpreting a law, there's three basic things you need to know as an angler. And one would be, what's the date? Um, pretty simple, pretty simple thing to know. Uh, the next would be, what type of water do I, am I gonna fish? Is it a lake or pond? Or is it a river, brook, or stream? And the third thing would be, uh, where are you going to fish? And more specifically, you need to know the name of that water, and you also need to know the zone that it's in. Um, and it would be a north or south zone. Um, tell you a little bit about what, zo what zones are. So if you look at this map on the left, and this is in the law book, exactly as it's pictured here. The, the green area is the north zone, and the, and the blue area is the south zone. And they're typically broken up by counties. Uh, with two exceptions, uh, Penobscot County and Oxford County are split. A little bit, of, little bit of history on this. The reason we have the north and south zone is the north zone is full of native and wild uh, cold water fish species, and the, the general law regulations for those areas tend to be a little more protective. Uh, whereas in the south zone, we have more stocked. Most of the, most of the trout and salmon, salmon are stocked, and we also have more warm water fisheries. So the general law regulations in those areas in, in the south zone tend to be a little more liberal um, and allow more angling opportunity. Um, many of the waters are open year round and we also have a lot more fall fishing off the south zone. So additionally, a couple of things anglers want to be aware with, they, they should be familiar with their target species and how to ID fish. Um, you don't want to be thinking a salmon is a brook trout. Uh, otherwise, you know, Brock may come along and not look too kindly on that. Um, you also want to know what kind of gear you're using. I, I, I use in artificial lures, I use in flies, I use in bait. Um, and, and we'll walk through a few examples next. So first thing, one of the most common things um, 
people make, one of the biggest mistakes is they just go to the law book and they open it right up to the listing of waters and they just start using it. But they really don't have any familiarity with the, the book and how to use it. So right in the book, when you open up the front cover, um, there's a section here called how to use this book. I would start there yeah, if I was gonna be doing it. And the very first step you see, the step one, it's not really a step, but what it is is a reminder that all general fish, that general fishing laws um, to, the, to the left of this, this arrow actually points to the left, that the general fishing laws apply to all inland waters. And they also tell you where to find the, all the general fishing laws. Um, the next step is really the step on how to use this book. And it's a two part step. What you wanna do is go to the listing of specials. It's an alphabetical listing of all waters that have special, special fishing regulations and you look through it. And if you go down through that list and your water is listed, then general laws apply as well as the specials that are, that are listed for that particular water. On the other hand, if your water is not listed, then only the general laws apply. And we'll look at the general laws uh, right now. So if you, a few years ago when we redesigned the book, Joe was talking about simplification. We actually redesigned the book. And if you open it properly and you open the front cover flap, the view on my screen or on your screen is kind of what you're gonna see. This was actually designed intentionally this way. And the beauty of it is in the old book, you used to have to flip through three different places. You'd have to look for the general laws in the front of the book, the special codes were in the back of the book, and then you'd have to look at the specials. And you were flipping back and forth, driving yourself crazy. Um, so if you, if you open this now, you see the general laws are here, all the codes are here, and all the specials are here, and you can kind of see them all in one view. So it makes it a lot easier than it used to be. Um, so a little bit about the general laws. Again, remember the, remembering that these apply to all waters. There's kind of like three main sections. One is what type of gear type you can use. And, and you'll notice in the gear type section here, there's a north zone and the south zone. That's why I spoke earlier, you need to know what zone you're in. in the seas, under the seasons, there's a lakes and ponds section, and then there's a rivers and streams section. And that under the lakes and ponds section, you'll also notice that's broken up into the north and south zone. And then you get into a bag limit um, and a length limit table. So your bag limits are here and they may differ between lakes and ponds. And there's a length limit here and they may differ between lakes, lakes and ponds and rivers, brooks and streams. And then you got a list of the species and you just follow those across. So let's, let's actually look at an example of a water that's not listed. So every page in the special section, if you look at it in this red block, you probably can't read it, but it says if your water is not listed, then only general law regulations apply. So it's, this will be hard to see, but let's assume I want to go fish Loon Lake in Wyndham. And so I'm zipping down here, looking alphabetically. Oh, there's Loon Lake in Dallas Plantation. Nope, that's not it. There's a Loon Lake in T8R, T6R15. That's not it. And then we jumped in Loon Pond. So Loon Lake in Wyndham is not there. So that means only general laws apply. So you'd come up into here and you look. Wyndham, I happen to know, is in Cumberland County, which is in the South Zone. So the terminal gear regulation would be here. We go into the season and we know it's a lake and pond. Cell zone, this would be the season. And then we'd go into the species bag limit depending on whatever we were looking at. So that's kind of how it works in, in general. So now let's actually look at two waters as examples that have specials. We'll look at these ones highlighted in yellow. One is Little Long Pond and it's a cell zone water. And then the next one will be Lost Pond. And that's a north zone water, which is a little more complicated. So we'll go through each of those examples. So, and I've blown that up over here on the right so you can actually see what the special is. And also I put any of the codes down here in bigger text so you can, you can see what the definition would, would be. And those definitions, again, would normally be under this table. And I've blown up this table here so you can follow along. So we look at little long ponds. Uh, one thing I wanna point out here is when you see a descriptor like little or big in our law book or east and west, a lot of time, almost every time, um, the main name comes first and the little is separated. So if you went to look for little long pond, um, you wouldn't find it. You have to look for long pond and then look for the little. Um, just, a, just a thing to remember. So if we're looking at long pond, the first thing you wanna see in, in all the waters that are listed will tell you what zone they're in. So we know it's in the south zone. 
And this tells you general fishing laws apply, except S16. Well, so we've got to figure out what an S16 is. We look under the definition down here. S16 is daily bag limit on brook trout, including Arctic char and splake or two fish. And there's a minimum length limit of 12 inches, only one max seat 14. So what you want to do is go over the general law table. And this is talking about bag and length limits. So we go into the general law table for brook trout. And we look here and we see south zone, which is we know where we are, and it's two fish for brook trout. So the special S16 also says two fish, so there's really no change there. So next, we want to look at the length limit. We know we're under a lake and pond. It says six inch minimum, but that S code is actually going to replace that. So the S code would actually replace it so that the regulation on a little long pond is a 12 inch minimum length for brook trout and only one may exceed 14. So we go back to the special, we dealt with that part. You go back to the special and it says from October 1 to December 31, it's closed to fish, closed all fishing. So you got to go back to the season. When we look at season, cell zone, this says open to ice and open water fishing year round, but you've got to add, so we now know it's going to change from October to December, it's different. So you almost have to like rethink that, that those dates and it would look like this from January 1 to September 30th, it's open ice and open water fishing, but from October 1 to December 31, it's closed all fishing. So now those are your regulations for Little Long Pond. It's these, these gears, this gear applies, this season applies. And for brook trout, these would be your regulations for brook trout in these red blocks. Now, what if you wanted to fish for bass? There's probably not bass in this pond, but just hypothetically speaking. So go down to bass. Uh, we know it's in the south zone, two fish. Uh, no minimum length limit, only one may exceed 14. A lot of people think that just the specials are the only regulations that apply. But no, remember, all the general laws apply. So if these other fish are present, in that particular water, those still apply. So let's move on to the north, north zone example. So we look at Lost Pond over here, and we see general fishing laws apply against another reminder. And it says, except CI. We go down, look at that definition. CI is closed to ice fishing. And so that's a season. So we want to look under here, seasons, lakes, and ponds. We know we're in the north zone. Now, if we read these from April 1 to September 30th, it's open to open water fishing. It doesn't say it's open to ice fishing. So it's already closed to ice fishing. And if you look from October 1 to March 31, it says closed to all fishing. So it's already closed to ice fishing. So the CI, we put those on our north waters because a lot of those are really um, important trout ponds. And it's just, a, it's simply a secondary reminder because those waters, waters would be very vulnerable to ice fishing. So, so right here, there would be no change. Um, those, are the, those are the season dates. You don't need to substitute the CI. So if we go back and we look at the next special, it says FFO. Well, FFO, we come down here, it looks, stands for fly fishing only. Fly fishing only would be a gear type. So you go up to gear. This is what you could normally do there, but that's gotta be replaced with the FFO. So this is, gets replaced with fly fishing only. And then we go down to the last special, which is S17. And S17 is very similar to the S16. It's, it's on brook trout and it's a bag limit change for two fish. And then it's got a, a special for the minimum length. So let's go through and look at that. So we go to, go to bag limit, lakes and ponds, brook trout, north zone. Oh, it says five fish here. But the special says I can only have two fish. So we got to replace that five fish with two fish. And then we go here on the length limit, lakes and ponds. It says a six inch minimum, but we know that's not right. That's gonna get replaced with a 10 inch minimum, only one makes heat 12. So now if you go back through, these are your regulations. It's fly fishing only. This is when you can fish it and what you can do. This is your bag limit on brook trout. Probably not yellow perch there, but let's take another hypothetical. What if I want to go fish for yellow perch? Uh, we go down through this list. Uh, there's no yellow perch listed. Oh, this one at the end says, Inland species not listed above. And it says your bag limit is unlimited, so you can harvest as many as you want. And on the length limits, there is no minimum or no, no length limits associated with yellow perch. You can keep any, any, any size you want. So that's it for my couple examples. I, I hope that was helpful. Some of the regulations in the book are, are more or less complicated than this. Um, so the last thing I wanna point out is that if you go on pages two through four, there is a general fishing laws 
section or another general fishing law section other than the table. And this is where you learn things like you can fish with five traps when you're ice fishing or it's illegal to use dynamite. Um, so you wanna be sure to just be familiar with these, read through these periodically and, and be familiar with these things. And the other th page is the definitions page. And if you look closely at these like fly fishing, it gives you a definition of fly fishing. Here's where you learn like, well, I can't troll on a fly fishing only water. So you do wanna be familiar with these. And you know, it takes a little practice and a little familiar, familiarity with the book. Um, so, but if you ever get stuck, um, like, uh, like Brock was saying earlier, feel free to uh, call one of the regional offices and speak to a biologist or warden and, and, and we can help you interpret the regulations. And that's all I have. That was very, very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to put that all together. I think everyone can certainly appreciate uh, the effort that you put into that and, and kind of illuminating some of the steps that you can take to be able to read some of those laws. I think at first it can seem very confusing, but if you just break it down the way that you did, it, you know, it, it's not as, as challenging as someone might think at first. And it's always you know, a good reminder not to use dynamite. <laughs> And uh, so, Joe, uh, you know, even though that was a really helpful tutorial, I know that we do have some tools and resources for people to make it as simple as possible. Uh, do you want to walk through some of those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Brock already mentioned the one that most people probably associate with fishing laws, and that's the paper law book. So that's available at town offices or licensing agents. Um, you know, we are, we are undergoing an effort to reduce some of our, our printing of paper books because, uh, you know, it's the responsible thing to do. It's a costly, uh, costly thing for the agency. Um, and, and it's also, um, you know, an opportunity to kind of uh, conserve some resources there. Um, but uh, paper books are available and we want to really reiterate to folks that if they do have a hard time finding something, let us, let us know. Reach out to a regional office, call the main headquarters here in Augusta. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that you have access to the laws that you need. And, and we don't ever want to hear that, that anyone's having um, a problem getting what they need. I've even gone to the point of printing information right off my computer and mailing it to somebody so that they have, have what, they, what they need to get. So um, don't, don't let that ever be a, a concern or a barrier for you. Um, so now I kind of want to focus on some of the newer um, uh, opportunities we have to view the laws. Uh, so I'm going to do a screen share uh, as well, as long as I can get that to work. Give me one second. Okay, uh, what I hope I'm showing you now. All right, looks like it's up. Um, so the, uh, the key place that I would direct people right off the bat is uh, to the department website. Um, and there's an address that you can type right in there uh, directly. Um, uh, just one second here. I need to move something around on my screen. All right, there we go. Okay, so uh, if you type in mefishwildlife.com slash laws, that's gonna take you directly to this landing page that you're seeing right now, uh, which contains all of the law information associated with inland fisheries and wildlife. And you know, we're gonna focus today on the fishing laws. So the first area that I wanted to talk about was uh, the the online PDF version of the law book. Now, what this is, is word for word, exactly like the printed copy. Um, what's handy about this is you can save it to your computer, you can save it to your phone, um, you can take screenshots. And actually with, uh, with a lot of the mobile devices, you actually have the ability to search by, by keywords or search by text. So you actually can type in a water name and it'll, it'll zoom you right to uh, that location in the special fishing laws section. So Jim already covered how to use the book, so I'm not going to really go into much detail on this, but it's important for folks to know that, um, that that is a resource that's available right on the website, and you can save it right to your phone. That's what I do. My phone's with me every time now when I'm fishing, and uh, that way I can take a photo of anything that we catch, uh, but I also have the laws right there real handy. Uh, all right, the next one I want to talk about is... Uh, the website in general um, also has uh, all the components of the law book uh, broken down by individual web pages. And um, right here uh, is a link to the special fishing laws. Now, this is going to take just a second to load up because uh, there is a lot of data that's associated with this. Uh, but what this will end up showing is 
the entire uh, special fishing laws section of the book, but in tabular format here. Um, what a couple things that people should be aware of. So at the top here, you've got links to the, to the general fishing laws, uh, seasons and bag limits, and uh, the general fishing laws and definitions that Jim already talked about. Uh, but, but here's the real interesting part down below. Uh, we have this, this table and it's actually uh, searchable and sortable. So I'm gonna just type in an example here. You can search by water name. Let's say I wanna go fish West Grand Lake. First record that comes right up, uh, I get West Grand Lake. Uh, that's down in, in Washington County uh, around Grand Lake Stream. And I've got all the regulations here for West Grand Lake uh, showing up. Um, there's a link that takes me to what the South Zone general laws are so I can find my way around. Um, I can scroll down here and I can see all the S codes listed. But what this tool does, which is really handy, is it actually expands the definition of each of the S codes. So there's no reason to flip or move back and forth to try to look up what it is. I can see that S1 means close to the taking of smelts. It's listed right here. All right, I'm gonna just show one other example of what you can do with this. So, you know, the law book was really designed to be a tool to show you uh, what the regulations are on a specific water, you know, where you are fishing. Um, what we're seeing now is there's a lot of interest from people to be able to use it as like a planning tool. Um, and some of these uh, new features that we have here can actually help folks do that. So um, here's an example. Let's say uh, I want to go to, I'm going to be in Franklin County. So I can type in Franklin County under the county search tool. And let's say I'm interested in opportunities uh, to fish waters that are fly fishing only. Uh, I know that the fly fishing only code is FFO. So if I type FFO into the search, what I now have here uh, is all the waters in Franklin County that have that FFO code. So I can see all of those waters now. Um, there's actually 58 entries here, uh, which means there are, are several pages displayed. Um, I can actually change how many, how many uh, individual entries I see at a time. Um, the other neat feature here on this tool is I can, I can print, uh, print what I've just searched for and sorted out. So uh, I could set this up to print only those waters in Franklin County that are fly fishing only. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, the sortable table that we have there. It's real important for folks to remember uh, the general fishing laws, of course, still apply just as Jim had described everything. So. Uh, you know, want to make sure that you're referencing those as well. Uh, I'm going to go back to the laws landing page now and talk about uh, the third tool uh, that, that we have out there. It's called the Fishing Laws Online Angling Tool, or uh, the acronym that we, that we use for that is FLOAT. Tried to come up with something a little catchy there. Um, so it brings you to this uh, FLOAT informational page here. It tells you a little bit about the tool. Um, uh, shows you um, down here how to actually save a link to the tool directly on your phone. I have this right on my, my home screen of my phone uh, and I can just click right on it and it'll take me right to it. So I'm not going to go through all those details, but that is listed here for both uh, iOS and Android devices. I'm going to go ahead and launch the tool now. And you'll see the first thing that that comes up here um, is a little, a little message that pops up, just, just letting folks know that this tool is really for informational and planning purposes and that the official source of fishing regulations is the printed or PDF version of the law book. So I'm gonna click okay and move past that. And, and what we can see is, is basically what we have is the special fishing laws uh, displayed on a map. Um, if you could take everything in the special section and put it on a map, this is what it would look like. And I'm gonna just walk folks through uh, how, how to get started with this tool. First thing I would recommend is uh, right up here is a, is a button to take the tour. And what this will do is it'll just take you step-by-step step through the, the functions and features of this tool. Um, tells you how to, how to navigate through everything. Um, I'm gonna stop right here on this one. This one's pretty cool. So the locate button, if you're viewing this on your phone, um, on your mobile device and you have GPS enabled, you can actually click that locate button and it will zoom you right to the spot where you are. So if you're standing on the lake and wanna know what the regulations are, you click that and it'll take you right there. Um, so there's a few other uh, tour items there that I'm just gonna skip past for now. Uh, but the next 
next place that folks should really take uh, take a second to read is go through these quick start instructions. Sort of tells you um, how how everything functions here with this with this tool and, and how to navigate along. Um, other a couple other places I'll point out first is there are, are four different tabs here uh, in the margin. So there's a search tab, a legend tab. I'll, I'll go back to the search in a minute and talk about that a little more. But uh, a legend tab here that talks about what the colors mean, uh, what some of the symbols mean when you're looking at the map. Um, and then the fourth one is a resources tab. Uh, and that will take you to a link showing the general fishing laws in either the north zone or the south zone. Uh, some other uh, important areas uh, to be aware of, whether it's um, angling in, uh, in border waters or uh, tribal uh, areas of the state. Uh, link to purchase a fishing license. You can actually get back to the PDF version of the law book here and also a link to send us information uh, if you have questions or comments about what you're seeing. So I'm going to go back to uh, the let's let's go through one of the two ways that you can navigate around in this tool. So a lot of folks um, will, will maybe want to just hop right in here and start zooming around the map. So you'll see that uh, the map is divided into the north and south zone when you're at the full extent, when you're zoomed out a ways, so you can tell which general law zone applies. And as you zoom in, uh, things begin to change here. So Let's say I want to go to Sebago. So once I get, get in here a little closer, I see that uh, that overlay color disappears and I can start to see um, blue waters and red waters. And the red waters are those with special regulations. So I'm going to head to Sebago Lake. I'm going to zoom in here on Sebago. And what you'll see is when you click on Sebago Lake, you get a pop-up. And that pop-up is showing uh, some information about Sebago, the, the name, the town, uh, the area that this regulation is describing, and then all of the special regulations for Sebago Lake. Um, again, here, let me see if I can find an example. So again, just like the last tool we were looking at, the S codes are expanded out and defined so that you don't have to flip back and forth and go back and look up what S1 means. It's spelled right out here for you. Um, another cool feature about this tool is uh, you can click on a link here to view a PDF of the special regulations for just that water. So you can print this, you can save it, save a screenshot, you can save a PDF version of this to your phone. Um, you, can, you can do this for as many waters as you plan to fish and have them all right there, just as if you were looking at them in, in the law book. So now we're gonna go back to, back to Sebago. And I just wanna point out one other interesting feature here about the, the float tool. Um, you notice these green triangles. Um, that's something you want to be paying attention for, and it describes this in the legend, but uh, these are notable change markers, and those are there to signify a change in regulation. So Sebago Lake is a public water supply, and there are regulations, uh, special regulations around where the water intake is located. So there's, a, there's actually a different set of rules that folks need to know right here compared to here on the other side of this notable change marker. So when I click on this one, I can see, move this out of the way, I can see the area becomes yellow where the regulation applies. I can go back to the box that popped up and I can look and I can really see that in this case, the difference is uh, this information right here, that uh, the area within two miles of the intake is a no bodily contact zone uh, and no motor vehicles are allowed on the, on the ice. Um, so anyway, the notable change marker is something you want to be paying attention for. So you can just pan around the map and see what else, uh, what else is there for special regulations nearby. Um, the other way that you can use this tool, I'm going to zoom back out a bit and uh, show you how the, the search function works. So with the search tool, um, you can type in a water. Uh, let's say I want to go to Swan Lake in Belfast. Type in Swan Lake, takes me right there, zooms in right into it. I can see the regulations for Swan Lake right here. I can print the PDF of the special laws. Uh, and uh, I can also see that the neat thing about this is Swan Lake has an S3 regulation, which means direct tributaries are closed to the taking of smelts. I can now see on the map that these direct tributaries to Swan Lake, when I click on those, I can see they are close to the taking of smelt. So it really gives you a visual representation 
of, uh, of what's, what's out there, um, what's on the landscape for special regulation. All right, uh, one point that I did miss that I'm gonna go back to on the, <laughs> I just remembered this, on the, uh, the sortable table here, if you're viewing this on a mobile device, you do have some limitations on your search, okay? Um, there's a lot of data that drives this. And what we're looking at right now is the desktop version of it on a computer. So you have all these search functions across the, the top here. On a mobile device, you can search by water name only. Um, uh, that's, that's still really handy. It can get you right to where you're looking to go uh, pretty quickly. But uh, this tool is really kind of optimized, I guess, on a, on a desktop, on a computer. Um, all right, that's, uh, that's what I have for, for tools there, Katie. I'll kick it back to you. Great, thank you so much. And while you were talking, actually somebody had commented that uh, they have the law book on their phone, but it's too difficult to switch back and forth in the law book. But these options are perfect for a mobile device. I even have, I have the float tool on my phone. I use it every time I go fishing. So it's a, a great resource for people with a mobile device. And again, you can look it up before you head out on the water, uh, just in case where you're going, doesn't necessarily have cell service, which we know is an issue in Maine. Yeah. And that's, that's a good point too. Um, you know, really what we're trying to do is create options for folks, a variety of ways for them to access the laws because really a one size fits all uh, doesn't, doesn't really work. So there's a lot of different options. Um, you know, you just mentioned about cell service um, or, or access to service. That is another, another key point for people to be aware of. Uh, with most of these tools, you do need, you do need access uh, for the float tool and for the sort of, uh, sortable searchable table you need you need access so whether an internet connection or, or cellular service again there's a lot of data that drives these um, certainly that's a future future goal moving forward is to make these even even better and more accessible um, and be able to able to store them right on your phone but the pdf is something you can definitely store on your phone and you don't need cell service for you always always have it right there Great, thank you. So I will just remind people who are watching, if you do have questions, we are gonna to try to get to them at the end of the conversation today. So you can continue to type them in. I know that we've had some uh, come through. So Jim, of course, right now, many anglers are you know, focused on ice fishing. Unfortunately, we do have some good ice conditions. Uh, this wasn't the case a few weeks ago. So we're pretty fortunate now to have the cold temperatures, although I'm freezing all the time. So how can someone tell if a water is open to ice fishing or not? So in general, Katie, if you look at the general law for the north and south zone, if you look at the south zone um, under lakes and ponds, um, lakes and ponds under general law are all open to open water in the south zone, are all open to open water and ice fishing. Um, essentially, they're open to year-round year fishing. Um, in the north zone under general law, <clears throat> most waters are closed to ice fishing by general law. But there are exceptions. Um, Oh, jump back to rivers, most rivers, brooks, and streams in both zones are to ice fishing. But there are exceptions um, in both zones and in even on the streams. So you, you definitely want to check the special law sections and, uh, and check there to see if they're, if they're either closed or open, depending on what zone you're in. Um, the tool that Joel just mentioned, that filter, is a great tool to, to use for this purpose. So say you want to fish in the north zone and you want to know it's open to ice fishing. Um, go into that and type in the north zone and then just uh, you, what you'd want to do is search for either those A or B waters. So you'd search for a, you know, a capital A period or a capital B period and you get a whole list of those waters in the north zone that are open. Um, conversely, if you were in the south zone, you might want to take a quick look at search for south zone and look for uh, ponds in the south zone that have a CI, uh, which would mean they're closed to ice fishing. But so but those tools are great. To, to help people with those types of questions. Um, that's it. Great, thank you. So Brock, uh, from Game Warden's perspective, what are some uh, good reminders for those out ice fishing now? Well, we started out a in December and January where we didn't have as much cold weather. So now we're actually getting some cooler weather. And so our lakes and ponds, as far as ice safety, uh, is doing a lot better. We're getting, the minimum amount of ice that we need for people to go out and ice fish on the lakes and ponds. And, you know, I, I would recommend to people to check the ice often. Uh, if they had any concerns, you know, they can contact their local game warden and we'll be more than happy to answer any of those questions. If we didn't know exactly, we're going to find out for them. Um, 
it's still very hard when you're out on the lakes and ponds that to not know where those inlets are and the outlets are or a spring hole but those are the things that we want people to you know be aware of when they go out on a lake or a pond or even a, a river uh you know that is uh, open to ice fishing um one of the big things that we look at too is uh what they can and can't use for live bait uh that is we see a little bit of it out there uh the the general stuff that we see is you know people using smelts and shiners but there are uh, other types of bait fish and we have good lists of them in our uh, fisheries law book that help people identify those illegal species uh, that they can and can't use, um, which is a great tool uh, for fishermen. Uh, one of the biggest things that we want to stress to anglers out there, at the end of the day, when you're done ice fishing, make sure that you don't dump your bucket of bait fish down the hole. Uh, that is, that is a, that's a no-no. Um, we do not want to try to put illegal types of fish in different bodies of water. Uh, as game wardens, when we do routine checks out on the ponds and lakes, we will check those uh, just to make sure. And we'll talk to people. You know, if they don't understand, we'll educate them. And, and that's very important to us. Um, you know, there, as far as ice fishing as well, too, uh, we want to make sure people know that there is a limit uh, of how many different ice traps, ice fishing lines that you can use. Uh, the general law in the state of Maine is five lines, um, but there you have to consult the law book because there are some places that you're only allowed to use two lines. Uh, also to remember as well that you're, if you're using a jig stick, that does count as one of your lines. So if you're if you're in a body of water that requires five lines only, you can put four ice fishing traps out, and you can jig with your jig stick. Um, and that is uh, one of the things we look at. Um, as far as supervision of your traps when you're out ice fishing, the law requires you to be under immediate supervision of your traps. Um, but we, you know, we, once the, we understand once the flag goes up, we encourage fishermen to go out and take care of the fish uh, that's on that trap and, and most people do. And we, we understand, uh, you know, that we, we want the fish be taken care of quickly, but we also, you know, they, we use some discretion out there. And we understand that, you know, there may be times that you need to run back to the truck to grab something. Maybe you forgot something that is keeping you warm out there or, or you know, different things like that. And the discretion is there from us that we generally will give, you know, somebody 15, 20 minutes, you know, to go back and, and we're going to be watching them, you know, and observing. And, you know, we want to make sure that, uh, that, the fisherman is taking care of the the lines out there, and but at the same time, we you know we understand that there are you know they they can do things outside of that too, um, and usually uh, most of the time you know people are very good about it. You know sometimes somebody will leave and you know put their traps out and then leave and come back two hours later. Well, we we really don't think that that is you know, using, uh, you know, good discretion as far as the, uh, the fisherman goes, but um, we're, we're out there to, you know, to help people. And if there's any concerns, we'll, we'll do that. Great. Thank you. And as a follow-up to that, from your perspective and a warden service perspective, what are some common violations that you see on the ice that just might be helpful for people to keep those in mind? Yeah. A, a lot of the violations that we will see during ice fishing season is uh, too many traps. Uh, you know, s somebody will have way more lines than uh, you know what they're what they're what the law is. So um, we want to make sure that they have what they're required to have. Um, don't leave their traps unattended. Like I said, we're going to use a little discretion to make sure that people are, you know, that 15 to 20 minutes. You know, we, we're we're pretty we're pretty good that way. Um, you know, our most important thing that as game wardens were out there, we're, we're looking for the intentional violators. 
you know, the ones that are out there taking too many fish uh, that have got 20 traps out and they're only supposed to have two. And, you know, they're, we can watch people, we can talk to people, we can interview people and, and we can make just to see, uh, you know, that they are intentionally violating the ice fishing laws. And, and we, we, we know that um, sometimes it's a, you know, we understand it's an honest mistake, you know, when they, uh, they're out doing violation, you know, if, 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 if they're, if there's a violation that occurs out on the water, sometimes it is. It, we understand that it's an honest mistake. And as game wardens, we're there to, you know, help educate them on that. Maybe, you know, make them understand a law better. Uh, and, but we understand that, you know, like I said, we're, we're looking for the intentional violator and, you know, sometimes mistakes happen. Um, and we, we really want to educate people. That's, that's our goal out there. We want to make sure that they understand the law out there on the lake or pond or river. And, uh, we're going to make sure that they, uh, have a good day with that. Um, one of the biggest things that we start to see now, uh, a little bit more of is respecting of landowners. You know, during ice fishing uh, in the winter time, we sometimes the as game wardens we will see, you know, some maybe trees getting cut on the shore and uh, that belongs to somebody else. It belongs to somebody else's, you know, on their property, and we start to see that. Um, if we have no trespassing signs, if there's a particular island out on a pond and the pond is right in the middle of the pond and there's a, uh, uh, some ice fishing going on and it, that particular island is all posted, we, we would really like to have fishermen respect the landowner and not go on their property unless they have landowner permission. Um, and it, as far as leaving, you know, big gatherings and, and stuff on the lakes and ponds too, sometimes people will leave their trash, trash, cans, bottles, uh, they'll burn stuff on the ice. And uh, we, we don't want that. It's not good for the lake, not good for the people around the lake. It's, it's just, it's not a good situation all around. And we encourage people to, you know, if you're going to go out ice fish for the day, just make sure you take your stuff uh, off the lake or pond with you. Great, thank you. And I, you know, I'll say I went out ice fishing uh, last weekend and we saw, you know, I don't think it was intentionally left, but just some garbage out on the ice and it happens, you're packing up, you might forget, you know, a Ziploc bag with a sandwich or something in it. And we just picked that up and threw it out when we got home and, and just makes it more enjoyable for other anglers out there. So if you see something, pick it up uh, and, and just be respectful of other people out on the landscape. Uh, who might be using the resource as well. So uh, we do have a lot of questions coming in. I don't think we're gonna get to all of them, but I do have a question and this is a good one maybe for you, Brock. How can someone find their local game warden? Well, um, there's actually a couple different uh, ways to do this. In, the, in our law book, in the fisheries law book, if you look on the inside the front cover on the back, there's a list of numbers there with our regional offices and whether it's in Gray, uh, it's in Sydney, it's in Greenville, uh, Ashland, or Bangor, you can contact our regional offices and you can ask to speak to a game warden. Or if you'd like, you can call the, uh, the Maine State Police, uh, depending on what area you live in, and you can ask to speak to a game warden. And we'll be more than happy to answer any questions uh, that they have uh, regarding any ice fishing rules and regulations. Great, thank you. So Joe, I think actually maybe this question is a good one for you. Uh, we do have some people who are, I guess they're looking to get more involved or looking at how they can get more involved in the lawmaking process, stay informed about public comment opportunities or talk to someone about their concerns with some of the fishing regulations. Uh, what, are, what do you have for them uh, for a way that the public or anglers can get more involved in that process? Sure, yeah, that's a great question, Katie. Um, yeah, so it is a public process. The, the rulemaking process that we go through is one that, that follows a, a structured public process that involves a public comment period. We, we have to advertise uh, those, those rulemaking proposals. They go 
Um, they get reviewed by uh, the, the commissioner's advisory council. Uh, so there's several steps in the process. Um, that's that's the, the process once a, a proposal is formalized. Um, there are opportunities for folks to engage with the local regional fisheries biologists in their area just to talk about what they're seeing out there, what they're, what they're experiencing with their fishing, um, and maybe even gain a better understanding about why a regulation is in place. Um, that's, that's probably the, the best place for folks to start is just engage with their local fisheries biologists. They really are the experts. You know, uh, my scope is kind of on a statewide scope. Uh, Jim and the six other uh, management regions that we have across the state, there's seven total. Uh, the, the folks in those offices, they really know those regions like the back of their hand. They know, they know the ins and outs, they know the waters, uh, and they know the fisheries that are there. So really encourage folks to just um, start at that local level and, and talk with their, their regional biologists in their area. Great, thank you. So I have another question. Uh, Joe, this might be another appropriate one for you. Um, so how do you determine which species to stock and then balance that with the native populations that might already be in the water? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so determining what species to stock is generally dependent on some of the characteristics of that individual water. So the water quality as it relates to fish preference uh, or, or maybe what they need to survive. So uh, water depth and temperature are some of the key factors that might dictate which species we can stock. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, a few species across the state that, that we produce in our main hatcheries, uh, brook trout, landlocked salmon, lake trout, splake, brown trout, rainbow trout, um, and, and those are what we have available to, to stock. Determining uh, where and when those go, like I said, it, it depends on the individual characteristics of each water the management goals and objectives for each water, um, you know, what we, are, what we are striving to produce there. Uh, and then the, then the other piece that comes into play is, is other resources that are maybe connected to that water or within that water. And uh, certainly, you know, we're not going to be stocking fish if it's going to, um, you know, put, put some native species at risk of extirpation or, or causing some severe impact to those, those species. So we have some internal processes that we go through for any new stocking proposals, but we also have a public comment period regarding any new stocking proposals where uh, those get posted on our website. The public has the opportunity to, to provide their input and thoughts about uh, that proposed stocking. Um, and then that gets reviewed here at the Augusta office and a decision gets made whether or not to advance that stocking program. Thank you so much. So I don't actually, I don't know who to direct this to. It could be Joe, uh, maybe, or I'm not sure. So the question is, why do some bodies of water only allow two traps? Sure, I'll give that a try. I could see Jim smiling. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll take that one, Jim. Um, yeah, so that can be for a few reasons. Um, you know, I mentioned one of the uh, kind of the five key areas for regulating. Um, one of them is for social social desires. That's one one reason why some waters can have two traps. Sometimes also uh, a water that has uh, potential for really high use, uh, lots of anglers. Maybe it's in a really populated area. Um, potential for high use and therefore high harvest. We may we may apply a two line limit restriction uh, to help balance that use and spread it out over a longer period of the ice fishing season. Um, it, it can be pretty water specific, though, the reason it's sort of hard to generalize that. Um, but I would say if I was going to try to generalize, that's a that's what I would give for an answer on that one. I have a great question that just came in and uh, says recently retired and living in Maine. Do you have recommendations or resources for my wife and I who want to start fishing any clubs to join near the Bangor area and online forums? I know there's lots of resources for people. Uh, panelists, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I'll give some suggestions. Um, so yeah, the department website has, our website has a lot of great resources. Um, we actually have a whole page devoted to fishing resources. Uh, there's a bunch of links on there. We just created a new, a new page uh, for uh, folks to get involved in ice fishing for the first time, learning how to ice fish. Um, so that's a great spot to, to get some information. Another place that actually is a really good, can be a good resource is uh, social media platforms. There's a lot of different, different groups out there that have formed up now 
um, you know, angling groups where you can ask a question and, and get input from other people that are that are already um, engaged in the activity. Um, I guess another another option that I'd recommend is uh, local fish and game clubs. Uh, those are still certainly active on the landscape, and that can be a great way to network and uh, get to meet people that are also interested in the same things. Um, I know the the question was in reference to the Bangor area. I know that there are a few uh, a few clubs in that area. The Penobscot County Conservation Association is one in that area. Uh, Penobscot Fly Fishers is another another club in that area. So yeah, there's definitely some resources out there for folks to get. Get information and uh, and be able to to kind of get in and hang out with other people that are interested in the same things. And ice fishing is a great opportunity for people to get out and and sort of start experiencing Maine in the winter. It's actually warmer on the ice than you might expect, and you can find some great gear options. We got some of our ice fishing gear secondhand and it was a fraction of the cost of buying new and we kind of had to fix some of them up but they were perfect for going ice fishing this past weekend and we also got a tote and even a little pop-up so we can stay warm so there is it's a it's a good opportunity for people to get out there and kind of test the waters with uh, some fishing opportunity so uh, we don't have too much more time left, but a question did come in and, and I know the answer, but <laughs> they are wondering if they're allowed to transport fish from bodies of water to different bodies of water. So since no one else unmuted themselves, I'll jump right in. Uh, that's a, that's a, a no. Um, you can't, can't move fish from one body of water to another. Um, it's against the law to stock fish in, into any body of water in the state um, without a permit. We do issue uh, permits for private pond stockings. So that's a little bit different. That's really the only opportunity that you could possibly do that, but it's a very uh, structured process. There's a, a, a thorough review that goes into that. Um, and it's very limiting on the species that you can, that you could um, place in your private pond. But as far as moving fish from one body of water to another, that is a, a big no-no um, and is actually uh, a, a major threat to our native resources of our state. So someone just asked, thank you, Joe, uh, where they should look for the float tool in the app store. And that's not an app on your phone. It is uh, a web-based tool that you can find by going to our website. I believe we put the link in the chat, but we can always put that back in the in the chat so you can find it. You can save it to your desktop and we have instructions for you to be able to do that, but it's not an app yet. I know that maybe one day we'll have an app in the in the store. So I think that's actually all the time that we'll have for, for questions. Uh, you know, we do have some chatter in, in the comments, but we don't have a whole lot of time left. And so I just want to take the, these last couple of minutes to thank our panelists for joining me today and going over some of these, these things and walk taking the time to walk through the law book and answer um, some folks' questions. I hope to do more things like this going forward in the future. Uh, so thank you everyone and thank you everyone at home for joining us and, and just a reminder, this is recorded so you can access it again at any time. Thank you.